Are there any questions? Hi, okay, can you hear me? Okay, my question uh, is for Elizabeth. I can't quite see you. <laughs> Hi there, <laughs> it's good to see you again. <laughs> I remember you from that class, yeah. Um, so my question, well, let me preface it by saying how moved I was um, by uh, your classroom uh, and the um, ethos that you have so successfully evoked in it, um, this ethos of wonder uh, and making your students feel freer to, um, to think and to wonder. And my question for you is this, um, what would you suggest to historians of science who want to bring that ethos into their writing? Um, how, do we, how should we write about this stuff? lovely idea that you suggest, Diana, um, bringing, the, bringing the history, the science to, to life in the writing that you do. Um, I, th I think fo following and developing, uh, like what I said Professor Buckwell did with us about uh, Faraday and Maxwell, uh, the, the, the thinking, the, the uncertainties, the process, and uh, not, not uh, presenting it in a way where uh, you're uh, sure where it's going to end, but uh, putting the reader in the position of the uncertainty that the historical figure is also in the midst of, and, and elaborating that with the context, the swirling around of personal and, and uh, cultural and educational and scientific uh, materials and experiences. That, that could be fascinating for learners. Yeah. Any further questions? I have a question. Am I allowed to ask a question? So I have a question for you about the Coulomb experiment. So I remember Jed <coughs> destroying Mathematica, trying to calculate the, the attractive force between two spheres, two conducting spheres, um, the way that I thought it was Faraday had done it. That was the Coulomb. So Coulomb did calculate the corrections to the 1 over R squared force law. But that, w that was Coulomb, not Faraday. I was trying to calculate the flux on the spheres. You put two large conducting spheres of about the same size, not too far from one another. And then, you know, the heat, that was 1811 calculation of the redistribution, <coughs> where he had to use expansion polynomials for the first time. But what would you actually get out of that if you compared it to some of the data that Coulomb picked up when he did something similar to that? And, that, and it, that's when I was trying to do that. And when I did that, the numbers were coming out very much like what the calculation was between the experiment. As I said to Al, uh, as he remembers, there's got to be a way of making that device work uh, because the, re the, the numbers coming out of it that Coulomb had used actually to do his measurements on such a thing are too good. And that's when Al, we had uh, the students try to do it and they were totally unsuccessful. And uh, I said, Al, well, you keep at it after the course, which he did. And you know, boy, did he work. He had to make the threads and everything and um, uh, produce some mathematics to calculate what the force law would be. <laughs> from his measurements, and then I remember one day after th six or seven weeks, he walked in, and if I recall correctly, he looked at me and he said, Eureka! He had actually produced the numbers that Coulomb had, uh, actually the very same numbers that Coulomb had generated, and I went and he, we photographed it, we, as he said, we videotaped it just so that we're not lying about these. I hope he still has that videotape somewhere. Yeah. Good. 
Uh, and I was, and then he showed it to me, and he could keep, he could keep making it happen. He had learned how to make the very tricky apparatus work. You can learn how to make it work, and obviously people at the time did, and not historians, apparently. Hi, I have a question for Al. Is Graham in the room? Graham, Bernard, gone. So it turns out that um, all of us who were trained between the 80s and now went through the same dilemma. Do we read all this stuff about relativism and invented facts and so on? How should we orient our careers, our future? Do we pay attention to this? Is it important? Do we, and we we tortured ourselves as, as uh, in the late 80s and early 90s as graduate students. So you have shown that this whole story about, you have proved that, that Coulomb's experiment is what he said it was. Now we at the Einstein Papers had another story, a story that also took more than 20 years because some of our colleagues in the 70s wrote some nonsense papers about how astronomers tried to please Einstein and announced fake results of the eclipse expedition. We have had to spend almost three decades, since I've come to Caltech, first as myself with having nothing to do with the Einstein papers and later with Dan Kenefick started his PhD, also had nothing to do with the Einstein papers. So I started working on the eclipse expedition results 30 years ago, this year almost. And he has proved and has written articles that Indeed, the two expeditions worked systematically, didn't talk to each other, did the data reduction, that Eddington didn't fake the results. But what do you do with this Graham Burnett attention span? All this work that we do, that we publish, urban myth still persists. Eddington faked the results, and that's what you find on the web. So that one paper, those papers published in the 80s in Sociology and Philosophy of Science have done enormous damage that is so difficult to repair. Now, finally, there's a book out on this. Maybe people will pay attention, but I doubt it. Is there a solution? How much do historians of science have to toil to repair damage done by the people like those that you spoke about. Yeah. <laughs> they spend two months and then we have to spend 20 years to show that didn't quite happen. Um, I began, like uh, some of us, in the field of Einstein, and in my case, special relativity. And I had been warned, and I had read articles saying, there's enough people working on Einstein and history of relativity. Don't go into that field. That field is done. Work on something else. So I took a risk by going into, I'm sorry? I, I, I took a risk by, by, by studying Einstein, and I also took a risk by not paying close attention to these social studies of science, anthropology, and sociology. Um, uh, so I took a double risk. In my case, it worked out. Um, but I think in my case, what I liked about uh, studying Einstein was I could see the wreckage of past theories that had been proven wrong. If you're in any of many new things that nobody else has done, then you go ahead and you multiply your conjectures, may have, would have, must have, and you come up with a great theory and get your good job, and then 30 years later, you gotta cringe as some graduate students destroy your work by just looking into archives that you didn't look, and that's kind of sad. 
But, but, but in my case, I saw the wreckage of these bad theories about Einstein. I mean, there's been so many of them. And just, just as she mentions the one about the eclipses, the, the, the latest one, of course, that just keeps growing and growing and growing, whether it's PBS, it's the Einstein's wife story. And my, when I work to debunk that one, as, as long as other people who have also debunked it, I realize this is never going to go away. This is never ever, 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 ever. So we have to learn to live. We, but what we do have to have is a simultaneous product <laughs> that is also appealing. That um, uh, so, so when I wrote my first book about myths in the history of science, part of what I wanted to do is, if you're going to debunk a myth, that's not enough. You have to replace it with something. You have to tell some story. So, you know, I remember when, when, when Dan's papers came out, Kenefic, and I was like, yeah, it convinces me. The original analysis of the eclipse expeditions is fair. This is evidence in favor of the Einstein theory versus the Newtonian version that Einstein gave. It, it's still as though something, I, I, my, my suggestion for all of us, which I've tried to struggle with is, what is the real story that we wanna say that's not just real but also exciting? And all of us who love history of science know that there is enough wonderful stuff in history that we don't have to make up bullshit. We don't have to make it up. So it's just a matter of how do we move the really neat stuff to the forefront uh, so, that, so that I think people can actually get hooked on the real stuff and gradually realize why it is that, that, we're, that we don't buy the other stuff. Did you also issue it towards some, someone else, the question? Um, the nonsensical stories about everybody, about Galileo, about Newton, about Ptolemy, about Darwin, about Kepler, there's all kinds of rubbish out there. Yes. Oh, well, you're, you're talking about it exactly what? Well, you're talking about a particular example of it, but it's out there, all over the place. All you can do is do the right work. It's not going to go away. You just do things right, and uh, um, I'll, I'll give you an example of one of them that was defeated. The traditional story we got used to seeing in science textbooks was Darwin went to the Galapagos. He saw that finches with different beaks eat different things, and he realized that finches from South America arrived there and evolved. So, so that used to be in textbooks. Guess what? Now it's not there. Frank Soloway, 1982, he succeeded in convincing biologists that just did not happen. But what they do, which is scary anyway, is they put Darwin's story on one page, then the finch is on the other side, and then the reader makes it up in his or her own mind without the writer actually saying it. So it's really fascinating how these myths continue no matter, uh, no matter what we do. Um, anyhow, um, it's, it's a frustrating thing. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's an interesting. Anybody have other insights about this or comments? Yeah, um, I lived through this. I debunked Simon Schaffer's um, story of the acceptance of Newton's theory. And I think my papers were good. And actually, a younger person came up to me today and say, oh, I was convinced by it. Um, but it, it basically gets ignored in the literature. Um, I think that's why Noel is a little cynical. You know, th th this, there's nothing you can do about it, or not nothing. I haven't figured it out, and I didn't try and do it a second time or anything. I, that was my word, and that's it. So I don't know what you do. Maybe I should, my paper sh <laughs> okay, thank you very much. And before I depart, I want to thank Diana one more time for inviting me to, to this event. And Chad, once again, happy birthday. And thank you to the four speakers. I had a great time. Thank you. <laughs>